in port for Mayo up to the coming of the railway because um, the roads throughout Ireland were not very good, they were almost non-existent, the uh, seas were the highways, so everything would have moved in and out of this port. So our first stop today is out, um, we're, we're going on the southern shore of Cubay and the rest of them then will be on the northern shore of the bay. Rona, when was, when was the key built? Uh, uh, the key was built around the 1780s. And those buildings that you see opposite us, those old stone buildings, they're not old at all, they're actually new. Oh, I recently built about 20 years ago, but there were buildings there, stone buildings, which were warehouses used to store grain and corn before they were exported. Um, about 20 years ago, they were all derelict, so they were not. The original stone was stored down right beside us at the Heritage Centre, and they built hotels and apartments, and then they faced them with the original stone. So these buildings look almost exactly the same as the original warehouses. And we have photographs in the Heritage Centre of the original buildings. Grace O'Malley was actually born out here at Belclair at a house, uh, or sorry, at a castle which is no longer existing. But for those of you that know uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly, um, Dr. Des Kelly, his house <coughs> is, was built very close to the site of the original castle. See, the tide is fully out, does not look great when the tide is out. And when it's clear, you can see a lot of the little islands. These islands are drumlands. They were left behind when the ice melted at the end of the last ice age. Um, all tourist information will tell you that there are 365 islands in the bay, but there aren't. There are actually 80 islands. <laughs> Most of them are not inhabited. Um, a lot of them are used for uh, grazing sheep, a few of them have holiday homes on them. And then of course there are the, the two big inhabited islands, is Clare Island and uh, Inish Turk. The O'Malley Castle, where Grace was born, was just here in this townland, into the right. by the O'Malley's <laughs> in 1457. Now, <laughs> so what we're looking at today would be sites associated with the O'Malley's, maybe not always with Grace O'Malley, but with the O'Malley's, but this is associated with Grace. This, as I say, is an Augustinian Abbey. That would have been the main entrance into the Abbey. Um, obviously, it was blocked up at some stage, and it is... Um, as I say, it was founded by the O'Malley's and the first um, abbot of this was an O'Malley from Sligo. So it has a good association with the O'Malley's, but you can see, you can see the um, beautiful uh, arched doorway there. We're, uh, we're going to go in, inside into it now. Uh, its association with Grace O'Malley is, <clears throat> she was supposed to have been educated here by the monks. It wasn't far down the road from where I told you her castle was. She would have hopped into a boat and come up here to be educated by the monks. And also, <clears throat> uh, it is suggested that uh, her, fir she, her first marriage was celebrated here. And uh, she was married twice and then had a, 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 a third relationship. But uh, her first marriage was to uh, Donal O'Flaherty from 
uh, Connemara. Now the O'Flaherty's had ruled in Connemara since the 13th century, so it was a very important marriage. It was a marriage of convenience between two important families. The O'Malley's were the important family in Mayo, and uh, in this part of Mayo, and the O'Flaherty's were an important Connemara family. So it was a marriage of convenience, and she was only 16 when she was married. Married here, and what they say is that the, the wedding was celebrated here, then they all sailed back, all the O'Flaherty's, and the O'Malley sailed back to Belclare Castle, had their feast for a few days, and then they, uh, then they, she went by boat to Connemara. The church itself, just, just the nave. Um, in here, there were two other buildings. One is the sacristy. This is the sacristy here. You can see it. It's blocked up. We can't go into that. And there was a third building. Uh, we, we'd be able to see it from the outside, which was the chapter house, and the chapter house was where they would have all, all the monks would have gathered um, to uh, to you say their office every day. And then there's an upstairs. Now you were able to go upstairs. They have a gate up there now, and the upstairs was was uh, all a dormitory accommodation. So just a few, <coughs> just a few. Sorry, a few. Um, things from the abbey. You see this one, this here, as you can manage, I imagine is the water font. Um, over here is what's known as an ombre, and that is where they would have the sacred vessels. The altar is still there, and this is a, a, a beautiful window here. Now, if we go outside, we go to bits, if we walk around that side, there are two uh, faces. Uh, of people uh, in the walls. So one is around this side and the other is here. So we, we, we'll see Kenya. If, if anyone can find them, particularly the children, uh, they're up in the wall. Okay. Uh, they would have gathered every day for their. Um, to, read the, to read the gospel. Looking little man. I don't know who that man was. Um, there are, some people say you, you, you find there was a lock in an old abbeys, and some people say that they are that one of the stonemasons put his own face in, or say that it might be the first abbot, or a face of the person the person who founded the abbey, which would have been Grace Amani. Grace Amani, uh, as we said there, she was married to. Donal O'Flaherty. Okay, I have to hold up. I hold it up to my chin. So, okay, so she was married to Donal O'Flaherty, and then she moved to Connemara. And they had three children, two boys and a girl. But after a certain number of years of marriage, uh, Donal O'Flaherty was killed in a battle, and she was sent back. She came back here to her father's castle. Now. By Irish law at that time, she should have been entitled to a third of her husband's estate, but she did not get anything. So she came back here and she based herself on Clare Island. And that's where she spent a lot of her time until she married for the second time to Richard Burke. But in between marrying Donal O'Flaherty and his death, and between her marrying uh, Richard Burke, she rescued a sailor from a Spanish ship and his name was Hugh de Lacey. Also just off Clare Island. And now they are supposedly, they got married in a pagan ceremony at a holy well on Clare Island. But nobody knows whether that's true or not. But anyway, they, she was with him, but not for too long because he was killed. And always you think that um, the battles are between, in those days were between the Irish and the English, but very often they were between rival clans, rival Irish clans. So there were McMahons from North Mayo and they killed him when he was out deer hunting on Ackle Island. So she was so disgusted, she decided to take her revenge and she, um, she went to Belmullet where they had their castle 
and she destroyed their castle. After that, another marriage of convenience was to a Richard Burke from North Mayo. I think again it was it was a marriage of convenience because he had a very substantial castle at just past Newport at Carrigahawley and we will be going to that castle later on. So the O'Malley's wanted control of that castle and the easiest way to get it was for Grace to marry Richard Burke. Now again folklore but there has to be some truth in it. They were married according to the old Celtic laws. And now the first marriage was in a church in, in Morris, but this marriage was a, a, a marriage according to the Celtic laws. And according to these laws, a woman had equal rights with a man and a woman could divorce a husband at the, on the anniversary of the wedding. Now you see, even though Ireland had been Christianized for a thousand years at this stage, this part of Ireland still held onto a lot of the old Celtic traditions when it suited them. So obviously this law suited Grace very well, that she could divorce her husband if she decided she didn't get on with him. So after a year, the story is that on the first wedding anniversary, Richard Burke, who had been fighting a battle in Athlone, was coming back to one of their castles, which is situated um, uh, just outside Newport. And as he came up to the castle, Grace was standing up on the battlements and she shouted down to him, I dismiss you. And that was the end of him. He had to move out of the castle and she held on to his castle. So she eventually got it. So they had one son and his name was Theobald which translated in Irish as to Tibbet. And she gave birth to him on board ship. She was away on a trading mission and she gave birth to him on board ship. And his name then, he was called Tibbet Nalong, which means the Theobald of the ships. And seemingly very soon after, a few hours after she gave birth to him, her ship was attacked by pirates. Her men were not able to cope so she got up from her childbed and she uh, repelled the pirates. So she was some lady. You see a sign which says the Clube Archaeological Trail and that signpost is pointing into a ring fort. Um, you'll be able to see the outline of it just here, just past the for sale sign. And there is a very substantial ring fort in there. These ring forts date to about 500 AD and in that ring fort there is a stone, a commemorative stone, which says pray for the soul of Peter Brown who had been made. Now the Browns were those that took over from the O'Malley's and they would have, after the, up to the beginning of the 20th century, the Browns of Westport House would have owned absolutely everything. The Browns originally were Catholic, but at the time of the penal laws, when Catholics uh, could not own land or practice any of the professions, uh, a lot of Catholic landowners changed the religion and they changed to uh, Protestant, but they just, a lot of them just did it nominally and they changed back again later. But the Browns changed and they stayed changed. So Peter Brown, which, whose name is on that stone, was the last of the Catholic Browns. Um, his son uh, then converted to Protestantism. But it's a very interesting ring fort to you, uh, and it's easily accessible from the side of the road. The, uh, the town of Westport, as it is today, did not exist. But for those of you that don't know, where I pointed out uh, Westport House this morning, where there was an O'Malley Castle, in front of that house, where the front lawn is now, was the original town of Westport. It was called Cochernamarth, which means the stone fort of the castle. And Cochernamarth was a small little fishing village. There would have been about six or seven hundred people living there in patched mud cabins. So. When the Browns built Westport House on top of the old castle, 
present West Courthouse was built in the 1730s. When they built that house, they then landscaped all the area around it. They built bridges, waterfalls, they planted trees, they made a lake. And then they looked out the front windows of their new beautiful house. What do they see out there? Only these small, horrible little hovels, which is what the town consisted of. And at that stage, the Browns decided they would prepare to have a lawn. So they decided they would flatten the town and move it a mile inland. So that is what they did. And in 1767, an advertisement appeared in a Dublin newspaper advertising this new town to be built. And it was advertising for um, stonemasons, architects, um, carpenters, all for the building of this new town. And they described the town and they described the octagon and the elevation of the buildings on the octagon. And that description, is, if you read that description, it is exactly as the octagon is today. And that uh, advertisement appeared in Dublin Faulkner's Journal um, on the 17th of March, 1767, which is 250 years ago. And that is why the Westport is celebrating 250 years in existence. But the original town of Westport is there much, much longer. But there's no remains of it. This was, uh, this was a Protestant church and it was built at the end of the 17, uh, 1700s. Um, it's, it was decommissioned as a church or deconsecrated and it appeared on a television program a few years ago where they took over an old building and they restored it. So that is now a very luxurious uh, residence. An O'Malley Castle but it was, it was owned by a chieftain called Edmund MacTibbet. And yeah, we will be getting out, but uh, I, just read, I want to read out this uh, okay. describe it. And this castle was where um, Grace O'Malley's son by her second marriage, uh, Tibbet Nalong, he was uh, fostered here. Now fostering uh, was a very common practice among the, the landed gentry or the important people in those days. And the reason for that was the parents were too busy fighting or making political alliances. So uh, a child was given at a very young age into another family to be reared uh, with the family. So this was a very good thing for, for Tibbet, uh, for Tibbet Nalong because he got a, a good home life, which he wouldn't have got with his own parents, and he was treated like one of the other children. He would have had all the affection, the discipline, and the care uh, that were given to their own children. Um, it also would have formed later a political alliance because um, if there were any battles, uh, then these people would have joined Tibbet to fight for whatever um, they were, uh, whatever his cause was. Now there's only very little of this castle left, but I have a description here which I'm going to read out to you. And it's kind of hard to imagine it, but the central hall, dimly lighted by one heavily mullioned window, high up in the eastern wall, was surrounded by a gallery from which hung arms, swords and pikes. The centre of the room was occupied by a table of dark red wood brought from Spain. Dressers with shelves loaded with Dutch ware, he's trying, he's objecting to us, and silver plate stood against the walls and benches and chairs. At each side of the fireplace, Iron brackets for torches of bogwood were fixed to the walls. The floor was strewn with ashes. Ascending by one of the stone staircases in the thickness of the wall, we enter a, spa a spacious chamber with mullioned window opening towards the bay. That would be looking out that way. Um, in the opposite wall of the castle, a window of similar structure looked out upon the Ed Sedgy Swamp. That's that way, Sedgy Swamp. This apartment was divided by an oak screen into a sleeping and a living room. The floor
floor above had several small chambers which provided sleeping accommodation to the women, to the men of the household. From there, easy access to the battlemented roof. The only openings in the southern and nor northern walls, which were those most exposed to attack, were loopholes or arrow slits. On the land side, the castle vaughan was protected by a swamp, that side here, and of course by the sea on the other side. Outside the castle were numerous skin-covered cabins. So they would have been surrounded by um, these small little cabins because obviously the castle itself could not accommodate all the, um, all the people who would have been involved in the running of this castle. Well, everybody in this area knows this story, and so there must be some truth in it anyway. <laughs> so St. Brendan, we all heard of St. Brendan, and he was around in the, 16th, in, in the 6th century. And he was found in abbeys all over the place, or found in churches, and he founded one in Hedford, and then he was going to Eris, to the Eris Peninsula, to found another one. So on his way, he came through Kilmina. This is Kilmina. We're in the parish of Kilmina, and St. Brendan is the patron saint of Kilmina. So uh, he was in Kilmina, spending a bit of time. Now, Clare Island, which some of you may know or may not know, was the stronghold of the O'Malley clan. And uh, Clare Island was plundered by a, a rival clan, and all the O'Malley males were killed. They were all slaughtered to wipe out the O'Malley family. Now, one woman escaped from the island, and she was pregnant, and she came, she landed in Kilmina, and she gave birth in Kilmina to a daughter. So that meant that the O'Malley clan was definitely finished. So she wanted to get the child baptised, so she went to St. Brendan to have the daughter baptised, and she uh, told him her story, and she told him about how all the O'Malley males had been slaughtered. So, St. Brendan, he picked up a flagstone from the ground and a well appeared, rose up out of the ground. And he dipped the child in the well and the child, which was a, a girl, turned into a boy. Good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, Modern that's science. how the O'Malley clan, of which Grace O'Malley was represents uh, the, this child being turned into a, uh, from a boy, girl into a boy. So I just pass it around. Yeah, Here uh, from about the 13, 1400s and they were the ones that founded uh, Borishul Abbey. Now it was quite common in those days for a ruling family to found an abbey. It was sort of a, a status symbol for them. So that's why they did it. Uh, this abbey doesn't really have an association with Grace O'Malley, but it does with her family. The abbey was founded in 1469 by um, Richard de Burgo. Now the de Burgos were the Burks. They had originally been de Burgo and they then changed to Burke. And the Burks would have, would have controlled this side of the bay, the O'Malley's the other side of the bay. So this was founded by uh, a Richard de Burgo in 1469. And it was founded without permission from the Pope. So it was, um, it, it was originally just a wooden structure. Then uh, about 15 years later, he got permission from the Pope to erect this uh, quite a substantial abbey. There was, um, there was the church, there was a chapter house, there was a cemetery uh, and dormitories and a repertory. The church is still standing here, uh, again without its roof because an awful lot of the, the abbeys and, and the churches lost their roofs around the time of Cromwell. Um, the main connection of the of Grace O'Malley's uh, family was on this hill here, to the right of us, was Tibbet Nilong. You saw where he was fostered. Um, this, uh, he was the son of Grace O'Malley and he had a castle here. 
um, but there are, are no remains of his castle. And again you see in a very prominent position on the hill and with the river and a lake here beside it. To an island in Loch Furness which is on the other side of the main road. Uh, they, they stay there for uh, avoiding capture. They were both very old women at this stage and they avoided capture for a while but then they were caught and they were brought back and they were um, the soldiers stripped them and broke their ribs and left them to die and they died. So there is a little monument on the main road just as you're going to the Borishul Bridge. Am ammunition for um, the family or for, to protect the castle. Then there is a ladder up to the, to the first floor and that ladder was for uh, safety measures because if you were going to be attacked once you got up to the next floor you pick, pulled up the ladder so they couldn't get, they couldn't get at you. From the, from the first floor up, there is a staircase in, in the walls. Again, like we saw at Pasalafi, the thickness of the walls, these walls are equally as thick. And there are all sorts of chambers and, um, and a staircase right in the walls. And that's up for a couple of floors. Then on the very top floor is Grace O'Malley's own uh, apartment. And you can imagine it being quite comfortable. And Anne Chambers, if any of you want to know the definitive history of Grace O'Malley, uh, read Anne Chambers' book called Grand New Ale, because she is the expert on Grace O'Malley. And a few years ago, well, it's a good few years ago now, when she brought out her book first, she, um, she held a night here in which she had a reading of, from her book. And it was right on the top floor. Everyone gathered on the top floor. There was a huge fireplace, and there were trunks of trees burning in the fireplace. Um, the walls had been hung with uh, animal skins, and there were rushes on the floor. And this was just to give it, to give people the idea of what it would have been like. It was a fantastic night. The only problem was that they were serving mead which was the drink that they used to, would have had in the time of Grace yeah. O'Malley, which is kind of honeyed wine. And uh, coming down the stairs was kind of dangerous because <laughs> it was just a, a spiral stair stone staircase, so you had to be very careful. It was a great night. It would be fantastic if something like that should be, could be done again. Now, if you look at the door, you say to yourself, why is there a door up on the top floor? Well, the door was there. That's in, in into her. That leads into her chamber, and the door was there for if they were delivering large pieces of equipment or furniture, it was taken up by rope and let into the door. Um, the battlements. You could also, when this when you could get the key for this castle, you could get up out onto the battlements and walk around in a fantastic view, and you could get the idea that. You know, no, no ship passing by would, could, be, uh, could not be seen by anyone on top of this castle. There is another. There is a story, um, again folklore, that uh, she, uh, her galley was anchored outside here, and it was connected by a rope to the uh, the head of her bed in through the door, in through a slit on the other side. So if anyone was going to attack her, ca uh, her castle or take her ship, she knew because her bed shook. <laughs> if you look on the other side, <laughs> and you can see again there are um, foundations here. Now in the wall are 
in yeah in the wall of, on the on this side here the side nearest to the sea there was a little room called a garderobe anybody know what a garderobe was no toilet and all it was was a little stone um little, like a little stone seat with a hole in it <laughs> and so it but it would be so and it would flow right down into the sea but it would be flushed twice a day because the tide came in and, and take it out again. <laughs> okay, um, you can see the little slits for the windows. Um, those slits would not have had glass in them. They would have just have been covered by animal skins. And um, you, they were also used, you could, you could shoot your arrow or your musket out through the, um, mm. the little holes. But it's such a pity that this is not available for people oh, to see yeah. because it's the only one that is so well and it is perfectly pre preserved. And you can see as you go, as you climb up to the top, you can see all the little, like small little chambers where some of the soldiers or her soldiers would have, would have slept. But when, I mean, when you look at the castle like this and you look at the one that we saw, Castle Laffey, and I described what it was like to you. Now, Castle Laffey would have been bigger than this, but it would have been the same idea uh, as to how it was decorated and everything else. But the funny thing is, when they were eating, they never, they just used their hands because there were no forks. Um, no, no for forks had not been invented by the time of Grace O'Malley. And they, they had a very good diet. They would have had, well, of course, these were the wealthy people. They would have had um, uh, all sorts of meat and um, vegetables. You know, they had, um, oh, they would have grown vegetables all around here. So they, they had a very good diet in those days. This really was just to give you a taste of places associated with Grace O'Malley. And as I said, if anyone wants to do an in-depth study of her, the ideal the best book is uh, Anne Chambers' Cronuel, um, and that is, I mean, that, that gives you the whole story of, uh, of the Pirate Queen, so that is the best book, and it's available in Seamus Duffy's bookshop in town. Um, as you can see now, the tide is in, looks totally different to when we started off this morning when the tide was fully out. If anyone wants to find out any further information on Westport, do visit the Heritage Centre, uh, which is where we started. Uh, because Grace O'Malley is really only a very small piece of what we have. Um, we, we, in the Heritage Centre, we deal with the whole Clew Bay area. And of course, the, west, the town of Westport, the, the only planned town in the west of Ireland and we give the whole history as to how it developed from being the O'Malley stronghold to the beautiful town that it is now. Oh, just one last thing. Uh, for Heritage Week, this, uh, this uh, tour was put on for Heritage Week and also for Heritage Week we are running a free guided walking tour of Westport on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock starting at the clock. Normally there is a charge for that walk but for this coming week we are running it free of charge. Uh, we got uh, 1,500 pounds from uh, the National Lottery. That's the only state funding we've ever got. Oh, uh, a lot of work. So, so much. You enjoyed it, did you? Very a lot, good. A lot of work. And when was the, historic, the Historical yeah. Society set up? The Historical Society was set up in 1985. By? And Jarlath Duffy. Main man, was he? Yeah, he was the main man. And it, it rose out of a, uh, an, uh, an evening history class. They decided there was so much interest, so he acquired the building and um, the rest is history. And you have a lot of guys with degrees in history, have your diplomas or... Me? Uh, yeah, members, members yeah, here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And where would they usually do it? Uh, um, Galway. Galway? Yeah. Mm. Or the Manute I've done uh, archaeology in Galway and I would have, my background would be history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I've done a, a tour guiding course as well. Good. Obviously. <laughs> mm.